In this video, we're going to revisit a circuit that we've seen in a previous video. And what we're going to do is we're going to examine this circuit in a bit more detail and hopefully be able to calculate the voltages across the different components in this circuit and the currents that flow through the components in this circuit. When we've done this, we're also going to try and plot all of these voltages and currents on a phasor diagram as well. So to begin with, uh, one of the things that we saw in our previous video is that we can express the total impedance of these two components, the inductor in parallel with the capacitor. We could express that as one impedance, which we called ZLC, inductor and capacitor, ZLC. And we said that that was equal to minus J75 ohms. If you're not sure how to reach that, um, it's worth going back to our previous video where we derive that using a couple of different methods. But what we could do is we could redraw this circuit and we could say that it looks something like this. We have that resistor, 47 ohm resistor, uh, which is still there, but we've, we've kind of summarized those two parallel components into one lumped component, which we've called ZLC, which has this value of minus J75 ohms that we found previously. Let's suppose that, uh, going back to our original circuit here, let's suppose we apply a supply voltage um, to the terminals at either end of this circuit. Let's say we apply a voltage of 12 volts to this, um, to this circuit here. And our objective is gonna to be to calculate the voltage across each of the components in this circuit and to calculate the currents that flow through these components as well. So now that we've simplified our circuit, we can see that the supply voltage, uh, 12 volts, so if, if we're writing this out in sort of full polar form, uh, 12 at an angle of zero volts, um, is, is going to be um, split into two voltages. And we'll call these VR, the voltage across the resistor, and VLC, the voltage across both the inductor and the capacitor in parallel here. And we know that these um, voltages must add up to the supply voltage. By Kirchhoff's voltage law, we can say that Vs must be equal to Vr plus Vlc. So to separate Vs into these two separate voltages, Vr and Vlc, we can use the potential divider rule. We've seen the potential divider rule previously. Um, in terms of resistors, we've seen formulae that look something like this, V1 equals Vs times R1 over R1 plus R2. We have V2 equals Vs times R2 over R1 plus R2. We've got other videos on the, the, the basics of the potential divider rule, if this is new to you. But these formulae don't only apply to resistors. We can apply these uh, formulae to complex impedances um, with some modification just as easily. So rather than two resistors R1 and R2, we don't have um, two resistors here, we have a resistance and we have this, this impedance ZLC. So I'm gonna rewrite these equations to look like this. We have not V1 now, VR is gonna be equal to Vs times our resistance um, over the resistance plus our impedance ZLC. So R plus ZLC on the bottom. And very similarly, VLC is going to be equal to VS times ZLC over R plus ZLC. So we have these two equations here, which are hopefully nothing new. If you're familiar with the, the voltage divider rule or the potential divider rule, then this is just an application of the same thing. When we come to put this into practice, though, in our case, this is going to involve complex numbers. We've got these J imaginary terms um, forming complex numbers. And we're going to see that um, put into practice here and how we go about uh, finding these voltages. So let's start with VR. We said that VR was equal to Vs times R over R plus ZLC. And so that means that we have, in our case, 12 times 47 over 47 minus J75. So here we're dividing by a complex number and as we did in our previous video, we're going to use the complex conjugate uh, 
to allow us to do that. And what I mean by that, if you haven't been watching our previous video, we're gonna take this complex number, which appears on the bottom here. We've got a, a real term and an imaginary term. We've got 47 minus J75. The complex conjugate is simply that complex number with the sign of the imaginary term changed. So if it was a negative, as it is in this case, it's gonna become a positive. And so we're gonna multiply this fraction here by the complex conjugate top and bottom. So we have 47 plus J75, remember we said we changed the sign, over 47 plus J75. We can multiply out this fraction um, easily enough. We have the numerator here being the, the product of 47 and this complex number 47 plus J75. So all we're gonna do is multiply those by 47. And so what we have is 2,209 plus J3,525. That's our numerator there. On the denominator, on the other hand, we had this sort of double bracket arrangement. Um, in my previous video as well, we talked about the FOIL acronym. And so applying the same thing here, we have... Uh, our first two terms in each bracket, the 47 times the 47, gives us 2,209. The outside, 47 times J75, gives us plus J3,525. The inside terms, we've got minus J75 times 47, which gives us minus J3,525. And then the last two terms, we've got minus J75 times plus J75, and that gives us minus J squared 5,625. Uh, what we also mentioned in our previous video, this J squared term, remember the definition of J, the imaginary unit, J is the square root of minus one, and so J squared is minus one, and so minus J squared, like we have here, is gonna be plus one. And so when we multiply something by plus one, it, it doesn't change. So we have plus 5,625 here uh, as a real number now. And so what we can do is notice two things. First of all, uh, these J terms disappear because we have plus J3,525 minus J3,525. They're going to go. And our real terms, we're left with 2,209 uh, plus, remember this minus j squared term has just become a plus or plus one. We have plus 5,625. Adding both of those together, we have 7,834. And what we can then do is we can divide both these terms by 7,834. That's gonna give us a decimal. Um, which is all right for the time being. Multiplying both of these terms by 12, we get something that looks like this. We have VR is equal to 3.38371 plus J 5.39954 volts. Remember, this is a voltage that we're calculating. So we've calculated the voltage across this resistor VR, and we can calculate the voltage across the parallel combination that we saw above, this VLC um, voltage across ZLC, in a very similar way if we want to. All we have to do, remembering those formulae that we saw at the start, we just make ZLC um, the top of the numerator of our fraction and the potential divider rule. Uh, but we can cheat a little bit here because we know that the total supply voltage is 12 volts or in other words, 12 plus J zero volts. It's, it's just a real number. So it's imaginary term is zero. And so because we know that VR is, is this, this term here, 3.38371 plus J 5.39954. And also remembering what we mentioned of Kirchhoff's law at the beginning, we said that the voltage across the resistor plus the uh, voltage VLC must add up to the supply voltage well, we can say that therefore, the voltage VLC must be equal to the supply voltage minus um, VR that we've already calculated. 
And so we can say this, we can say that 12 plus J0 minus uh, this VR term uh, gives us VLC, which in our case ends up as being 8.61629 minus J5.39954. Okay, so at this stage, we have calculated the voltages across each component in our circuit. Bear in mind that the voltage VLC that we've calculated here is the, the, the voltage across both the inductor and it's also the voltage across the capacitor because these components are in parallel. So we can use this voltage as being the voltage across both of these components. All that remains then is to calculate the current that flows through each component. And we can do this just by using Ohm's law. Uh, we know that I equals V over R, or in our case, I equals V over Z. We're, we're dealing more with impedances, not just resistances. Let's begin by looking at the current flowing through the resistor. So we can say that IR is equal to VR over R. So by that we mean the current that flows through the resistor must be equal to the voltage across the resistor divided by the resistance. And so we know the voltage across the resistor. It was 3.38371 plus J5.39954. And we're dividing that by our resistance, which in our case is 47 ohms. And just doing that division, uh, we're dividing each of the, the, the real and the imaginary component by 47. Uh, easy enough, we get a result that looks like this. And what we could do is multiply each of these real and imaginary components by 1,000. Um, th this result would be in amps, uh, but by multiplying by 1,000, we get something that looks like this, and that's in milliamps. Let's apply the same principle to calculate the current that flows through the inductor. So in um, our formulation of Ohm's law, we say that IL now, the current that flows through the inductor, must be equal to, this time, the voltage that's across both the inductor and the capacitor, so VLC is going to apply in this case, not divided by resistance this time, but divided by the reactance of the inductor. So when we put our values in there, we said that um, VLC was equal to 8.61629 minus J5.39954, and we're dividing that by the reactance, which we said in the diagram at the beginning, is J50. One thing to bear in mind here is that identity that the reciprocal of J, or 1 over J, is equal to minus J. And another thing to bear in mind, um, I'll just make a note here as well, is that J squared, remember J is, is defined as the square root of minus 1, and so J squared is minus 1. And that'll come in useful in just a moment. So let's get back to this um, this division here. The first thing we'll do is we notice that we're, we're dividing by J or we, we have a um, reciprocal of J here um, because we're dividing by J at the, at the, in the denominator of this fraction. And so rather than dividing by J, returning to this identity of, of 1 over J being uh, minus J, what we can instead is, uh, do is multiply by minus J rather than dividing by J. So we can rewrite this equation like this. And what we'll then do is we'll just divide by a, a normal, a real number, just like we did in the current through the resistor before. We just divide each of these terms by 50, which we're allowed to do. And so we end up with something that looks like this. But remember, it's still all multiplied by minus j. Now, what we can do is then expand out that bracket, as it were, to multiply each of the terms separately by minus j. So now we have minus j uh, 0.72326. But when we multiply our imaginary term by minus j, well, it was already uh, minus j. And so a minus times a minus gives us a positive. j times j gives us j squared. And so we now have plus j squared 0.107991. So this takes us back to the second little uh, 
identity we made down the side here, which is to say that j squared is equal to minus 1. And so when we multiply something by minus 1, we don't change its numerical value, we just change its sign. And so what we can write instead is that we have um, minus j 0.172326 minus 0.107991. That, that j squared um, has just become a, a, a minus 1 multiplying by minus 1. We've changed the sign there. Uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll rewrite that again, but just um, in order so that the real terms first and the um, imaginary terms second. So now we have minus 0 0.107991 minus j 0.172326. And that's a current, so it's in amps. Again, we could multiply that out by a 1,000 so that it can be expressed in milliamps if we want to. Uh, that would be minus 107.991 minus j 172.326 milliamps now. Uh, again, we can use the same principle to calculate the current through the capacitor, this time IC. Uh, we'll call the current through the capacitor. And again, we'll say that IC is equal to VLC. Um, we, we, we divide um, uh, that same voltage there by the reactance of the capacitor, XC. And we'll pause a second here because we, we can do this and, and would follow a similar method to what we've just done above. But we can cheat in a sense because we know that the currents through the parallel branches must add up to the currently that originally flowed through the resistor. The resistor kind of the resistor current feeds these two branches. And if we know the value that flows through the inductor, well, we've already worked that out. We can work out the current that must flow through the capacitor because it will just be the difference between the two. So what we can say is um, rather than, than working this out in a similar manner, doing this division like we did for the inductor, we can say that IC must be equal to IR minus IL. Um, and then we can just plug in our values here. We know IR, we know IL, and we can calculate the difference there. And again, we can multiply by a factor of 1,000. We can get our capacitor current to be 179.985 plus J287.21 milliamps. Okay, so at this stage, the, the hard work is done. The last thing that we said we would do was to try and plot our voltages and our currents on a phasor diagram. And to do that, it's preferable to have these in polar form. So I'll list here the values that we've calculated so far in this video. We, we were told the, the, the supply voltage. We split that supply voltage into VR and VLC. And then we worked out these three currents through each of the three components. And these are all in, in rectangular form or Cartesian form. We can convert those each into polar form. The easiest way to do that is just to use a, a scientific calculator. And we can then look at the magnitudes and angles of these, um, these different voltages and currents. And we can plot them on a phasor diagram. And so the resulting phasor diagram is going to look something like this. And just a few things to mention here. Um, if, you're not, if you're not familiar with, with drawing phasor diagrams, first of all, all of the angles um, that we saw in, in polar form are those angles measured from the horizontal. And so the horizontal is kind of our sort of default position or our starting position. So you'll see our supply voltage, which was 12 volts at an angle of zero, that's pointing uh, to the right here. So that it's it's not like a clock uh, or a stopwatch that starts at, at, the, at 12 o'clock, as it were, at the top. We start by pointing to the right. If we have a positive angle, that angle tilts upwards from the horizontal. And if we have a negative angle, that angle tilts downwards from the horizontal. And so VLC here, 10.17, at an angle of minus 32 degrees, we'll see that tilt downwards by 32 degrees from that starting point at the horizontal. Uh, same for all these other uh, 
uh, parameters that we've marked on. The second and last thing to mention with this phasor diagram is that we're going to try, and, and, and I've tried here, to draw the diagram to scale where possible. And what I mean by that is that all the currents should be scaled in terms of their magnitudes, and all of the voltages should be scaled um, by their magnitudes. So let's take a look here. We can see that um, this, this current here, IC, uh, which was 338.9 milliamps in its magnitude, is, is a bigger current than IR, which was 135.578 milliamps in magnitude. And so we express that by drawing uh, to scale a, a, a longer um, a longer vector or a longer phasor um, proportionally uh, according to that difference in magnitude. Similarly here, um, 12 volts for our supply voltage here is pretty much double uh, what VR, the, the magnitude of VR is, which is six, around about 6 volts. So we'll see that that, that um, phasor for the supply voltage is double the length roughly of our um, resist, resistor current. One last thing to mention is, I've said that these are drawn to scale. The voltages don't need to be scaled to the currents, as it were. These are two totally different parameters comparing apples with oranges, as it were. So we don't need our uh, voltages to be scaled to the currents, necessarily. Um, but the voltages do need to be scaled to one another, and the currents do need to be scaled to one another if we're going to produce a, a good quality phasor diagram. So I hope this video has helped, first of all, in analysing a series parallel combination of reactive components in a bit more detail, uh, how we handle those calculations involving complex numbers, but then how we can uh, convert to, to polar form to generate a phasor diagram like this.